Welcome to Murder Maps, a true crime show by Uniquely Twisted Productions. I'm your host, Summer. For today, for episode one, I want to talk about a very popular address, one that you probably will recognize. This true crime story is probably more known by its movie, but truth is stranger than fiction. Quite honestly, the true crime portion is downplayed in the movie, really, and they really play up the supernatural portion that may or may not have really happened. Uh, that was the bulk of the movie because it was a horror movie, but I want to really tell you a lot more about the true crime portion that was truly the insane, crazy, very interesting part of this whole story. So let's dive into this first episode of Murder Maps. 112 Ocean Avenue, or in Amityville, Long Island will forever bring chills down any horror and true crime fan spine. Yes, today we are talking about the Amityville house, as in the Amityville horror. This house was not only the scene of a brutal murder, it was also the house that brought uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren into the minds and into the public eye and made them a household name. Before that, they were really only known to paranormal investigators and those in that set, but most people didn't really know who they were. In fact, most people didn't know a whole lot about demonology and those things until um, this movie and, you know, Ed and Lorraine Warren. So the movie was a huge success. It brought this house into, into the public eye. It made this murder into a common household name. Uh, I think most people know the murder. Most people would know when you say the DeFeos, what happened, they would be able to connect them with Amityville. But most people don't really know the truth behind the actual story or how little paranormal played in the story. So let's start with our cast. Um, who were the DeFeos? Ronald DeFeo Sr., or Ronnie, as he was called, was born November 16, 1930. He was a very handsome man, and he won the attention of an aspiring model whose name was Louise Brigante. And I'm probably butchering that name, and I'm very sorry. And you're probably hearing some noises around here. Um, my mini pig Scarlet is playing with her toys, and she is having a blast. Um, she's very much like a toddler. So you'll hear little grunts and jingly noises because she's playing. <laughs> Louise was born November 3rd, 1931, to wealthy parents, and she spent a lot of her time um, hobnobbing with stars and wealthy people and people like Mel Torme and was, well, was quite a bit above Ronnie DeFeo. And her parents really did not approve of their marriage. They were very upset about the marriage. And so they cut her off. <laughs> they were they were not having that. They cut her off. They had nothing to do with them. And then something magical happened. 
on September 26, 1951, Ronald DeFeo Jr., or Butch, was born. Of course, you know, the magic of grandchildren brings a family together. And, you know, suddenly the Brigantes couldn't wait to, you know, get to know their grandchild. And so they brought their daughter Louise back into the family. And with that, they brought Ronnie DeFeo into the family. But Ronnie was very hard on Butch. He was the firstborn and he was a boy and he expected perfection out of his son. His punishments were really, really harsh and very over the line. And so he would throw the child across the room, slam him into walls and give him other such punishments. Um, it breaks my heart to think of the way this child was, was treated. And his mother, Louise, just faded into the background and let him do it. Um, just kind of took the stance of, he's a boy, you know, let's let him, let dad handle it. Dad's the disciplinarian. And so she, she let him handle the punishment of their son. So Butch obviously did not handle this well. He was not a very well-adjusted child. He was overweight, um, so he was made fun of at school. He was very miserable. He was being made fun of school. He had a really bad home life. He turned to drugs um, and alcohol to numb his pain. He was very angry. He was very violent. At one point, he pointed a gun at his father. Um, his family became very afraid of him. And so to appease their son, he, they began giving him money, um, basically giving him anything that he wanted. They gave him a job at the family car lot that he didn't really go to, um, but he got paid. Uh, he just had a job in name only. They just gave him gifts, anything to make his life easy, to make up for all of the abuse and neglect and things that they had done to him when he was a child to keep peace so that he didn't go off on them. Butch wasn't their only child either. Um, five years after Butch was born, Louise gave birth to a daughter, Dawn, and then Allison was born five years later and Mark a year later after Dawn. But it seems that Butch wasn't the only one that was unhappy. Um, he wasn't really the only one that was mistreated in the family. A year after Mark was born, Louise took the children and left. Uh, I, I don't know, it doesn't, I didn't find any research saying that Ronnie mistreated Louise, but there was some stuff saying that he mistreated all of the children. So there's possibility that he mistreated Louise as well. And that's why she was very quiet about the way that he treated the children. And so she left and this just, he wasn't having that. You know, when she left, he not only lost his family, but he lost his station in life. You see, when Louis, when they had their first child, when they had Butch, and Louise's parents came back, suddenly he had money. He had the easy life. Because, you know, Ronnie didn't have, didn't come from money. He didn't come from a lot. He was a normal person. 
and Louise's parents made things easy for them. Uh, Louise's father had a car lot and he made Ronnie a manager of this car lot. So he basically ran this car lot and it didn't matter what he did, he made money. And so when Louise disappeared, so did the job. <laughs> So did the extra money that they got because of the kids and to make sure that Louise and her children um, were being taken care of at in the way that his uh, her parents felt that they should be taken care of. So he he really didn't like that. But Ronnie was apparently a very talented writer, and he co-wrote a song, The Real Thing, about his love for Louise. And this was recorded by Joe Williams in 1963, and it was, sorry, I kind of lost my notes here, and it was on his album, One is a Lonesome Number. This worked and Louise came back to him. And so when Louise and the children went back to him, so did the money, so did his station in life and his job and everything for Ronnie went back to normal, just the way that he liked it. And in 1965, they had their youngest child, John Matthew. At this point, the family moved from Brooklyn, uh, their Brooklyn apartment to a very affluent South Shore community in Amityville, Long Island. This is where they bought the Amityville house. Uh, the Amityville house is a large three-story Dutch style home and everybody is probably kind of aware of the look of the house. The view that we see that we see in our mind when we picture the Amityville house that looks kind of like a face, um, that faces the main road as you drive by with the big dormer windows and the balcony and all of that. Um, that's actually the side of the house. The front of the house kind of sits off to the side and you drive in and around to the front of the house. It's a very nice house, and it was well out of the price range for this manager at a car dealership. It had marble, a marble-covered foyer, crystal chandeliers, velvet-textured wallpaper, and everybody knew that Louise's father, um, who owned the car dealership that Ronnie managed, had purchased the home for the family. You know, he wanted to make sure that his daughter and his grandchildren had a big, nice home and were well taken care of. So in November of 1974, the DeFeo family had been living in the home on Ocean Drive for just shy of 10 years. So they had lived in this house for 10 years when everything went down. And I just wanted to point out that they lived in this house for 10 years. Um, Ronnie DeFeo was 44, Louise was 42, Butch was 23, Don 18, Allison 13, Mark 12, and John Matthew was 9. Butch worked at the family car dealership doing odd jobs, running errands, basically coming and going throughout the day. Um, and I didn't know until I started doing this research, but Butch was actually married. He married Geraldine Roman, Romano, Romando DeFeo and had a young daughter at the time of these marriages. At the I'm sorry, at the time of these murders, at the time of these marriages. He, he had a young daughter. Uh, this wasn't mentioned in most of the information. Um, I found this 
from um, some interviews that were done um, much later, um, several years after all of the murders and stuff, there were some interviews that were done for a book and he talked about his wife and daughter and there were later interviews with Geraldine and basically they didn't want their daughter involved with this. So they didn't mention their marriage. They didn't mention the daughter. Um, the wife and daughter weren't mentioned in any of the police reports. So I'm not sure exactly where they were at the time. I'm not sure what was going on at the time, but even that wasn't really mentioned. But they, it was just mentioned that he was married and had this daughter. But none of this was mentioned at the time because they did not want to involve her. And it wasn't mentioned at all in any interviews until after she was an adult. Because they didn't want this to, um, to do anything to her life as she was growing up. So, the family, um, the family and friends describe Butch as being very unstable, but his parents and grandparents and apparently his wife and everybody tried to keep him happy. Um, they gave him money and... Really, there's no information on his marriage or, you know, how his family was other than they lived with the DeFeos. So, I don't know how that all went, but I know that his family, his parents, his grandparents, everybody tried to keep him happy, keep him from going off on people by just giving him money, giving him this job that he could come and go as he pleased and do whatever he wanted. Um, by November, 1974, Butch had threatened a family, had threatened a friend with a rifle during a hunting trip, attempted to shoot his father but the rifle had malfunctioned and so he hadn't shot his father. Pulled a mock robbery with a friend to embezzle $20,000 from the dealership and they'd split the money. He refused to comply with the police about the robbery. And so his father, who suspected that he was involved, questioned him and Butch once again threatened to kill his father. Sorry, the camera kind of wiggled. Um, <laughs> Scarlett is running around and she keeps bumping the camera. I mean, she's, she's a little bitty. She's a baby still. Um, anyway, so in 1974, Butch was unraveling and he was unraveling very fast. So November 13th, 1974 at 6:30 at night on November 13th, 1974, Butch DeFeo walks into the bar that he frequents. Um and this wasn't really anything unusual. He come into the bar almost every evening, but he walks into the bar and he yells, you gotta help me. I think my mother and father were shot. And instead of calling the police, this group of men that are his friends decides to go with him to the house. So you've got Bobby Kaiski, one of Butch's best friends. John Alteri, Joey Yeswat, Al Saxton, 
and Williams Gordamaglia, who owns Henry's Bar. They all piled in Butch's car for the one block drive to the DeFeo home. And when they got there, Bobby, who is Butch's best friend, led the way into the unlocked house. The family has this dog, Shaggy, who's a sheep dog, who was in the kitchen and he was like tied up to the kitchen door because he was not housebroken. And so at night he would make messes in the house. And so they didn't want him to make messes on the carpet and stuff. So they put him in the kitchen, like tied him up in the kitchen so that if he made a mess, it was on the tile. And so other than the dog barking, the house was quiet and everything looked fine. There was no signs of a break-in and everything looked normal. Bobby being uh, Butch's, one of Butch's best friends and a very regular visitor to the home, he knew the home very well. He knew the layout of the home. And so he led the way to the master bedroom. And as they reached the doorway, he was overwhelmed with the smell of death. And they walked in and he saw Ronnie DeFeo laying on his stomach with a gunshot wound in his back. Louise was also laying on her stomach, but she was buried beneath an orange blanket. She wasn't moving and you couldn't see her wounds. Uh, the men saw that Bobby looked as though he was about to pass out. And all of them but John O'Terry took Bobby downstairs John remained on the second floor and continued to search the house. He walked into a bedroom with clipper ships, cannons, and eagles on the wallpaper. Um, there were Catholic statues and figurines on top of a dresser. And on the opposite side of the room were two beds. On these beds lay two little boys, both face down, with blood-soaked Nick's sweatshirts. Uh, these were the bodies of 12-year-old Mark and 9-year-old John. At this point, uh, John O'Terry decided he had seen more than he wanted to see, and he joined the others downstairs, and Joe Yeswat dialed 911. So it took them finding all of these bodies to call the police. Uh, the police found the DeFeo girls, Allison and Dawn, also on their stomachs with gunshot wounds to their backs. There were no signs of a struggle, no signs that any of the family members had been drugged, and none of the neighbors reported hearing gunshots or screams. The only noises heard were Shaggy, the DeFeo's dogs, barking that night. Being the only living family member and the one to find the bodies, police turned their suspicions to Butch. And they were having difficulty piecing together how one person did this. Um, however, they didn't know, you know, they did know that Butch didn't have you know, Butch had a tendency to not get along with his father. Um, he had a tendency to use drugs and alcohol. But how did one person go through the house and kill everybody in the house with them all laying face down and nobody screamed, nobody tried to get away, nobody do anything to try and stop it? So, there are many stories to one murder. What really happened that night is still being debated. Um, and Butch DeFeo has changed the story 
so many times it's impossible to tell. Um, I don't think we'll ever know what truly happened in that house. We know that when the police arrived at the home, they found Butch and his group of barmates waiting downstairs. Uh, the friends all told the same story separately, that Butch came into the bar at 6 o'clock that evening asking for help because his family had been shot. Butch's original story was that he arrived at work that morning around 6 a.m., and when his father hadn't arrived by 8, he was asked to call to check on him. He got no answer. He left work at 5 and went to the bar to have a drink and saw some of his friends. Then he left a little before 6, made the short drive to the house, and this is when he discovered his parents. He raced back to the bar and asked for help. And this is when... Um, they asked, why didn't he call the police immediately? You know, instead of going back to the bar, um, why didn't he call the police when he was in the house? And he said that it was because he thought it was a mob hit by Louise Fellini and wasn't sure what to do. So going to the bar and getting a group of guys to come back to the house with him was what he should do. Instead of just going to the bar and calling the police, maybe? I don't know. Uh, by the next day, the police had found several holes in Butch's story. First, Luis Fellini was out of state and had a very solid alibi. Uh, Butch had arrived at work early the morning of November 13th, which was completely out of character for him. He never arrived at work before noon. Uh, but he left work at noon that day. He didn't leave at 5 o'clock. He left work at noon. The coroner found that the family had been killed before 6 a.m. So they had been killed before he arrived at work. When confronted with these concerns, uh, Ronald Butch DeFeo confessed to killing his family at 3 a.m. on November 13, 1974 with a gun, with a shotgun. While they slept in their beds, he stated he acted alone. And during his confession, he stated, once I started, I just couldn't stop. Uh, Butch was arrested and charged with these murders. Um, although the police went along with the arrest, they still could not figure out how he acted alone. This is still something that's being debated. Nobody can figure out how he acted alone. All of the DeFeos were killed on their stomachs. Um, what was especially bothersome was that Mark DeFeo had a football injury. And this made it difficult for him to lay on his stomach. He was supposed to sleep on his back. It would have been hard for him to turn over in his sleep. He would have had to have had help turning onto his stomach. So they know that he wouldn't have been asleep when he was shot. On October 14th, 1975, the trial for the murders of the DeFeo family started. Butch pled not guilty by reason of insanity. And this was the first time that voices or the supernatural entered into the case. So, although Butch goes back and forth with this and some sources use more mental health drug, and drugs and Others use supernatural, more of the supernatural, um, just depending on the reports that you get. Uh, Butch goes back and forth with this, and in most reports, some reports, he's not happy with this. This was not what he wanted. So, Butch was found guilty of all six counts of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Butch did not want his sanity to be questioned. The problem seemed to be that the court systems were not making it easy on his defense. 
So Butch's first attorney was let go after his grandfather spent over $40,000. And this was in 1975 that he spent $40,000 on this attorney. And the prosecution, prosecution was still withholding evidence that could have been crucial to the case. So the defense attorney couldn't do anything because he didn't have all the evidence. Butch was given a state appointed attorney who asked for additional time to prepare when he didn't receive the documents until less than a month before trial. Um, the state appointed attorney was overwhelmed with the evidence because, you know, he gets it a month before the trial and he gets just bombarded with all this stuff. Um, much of which implicated an accomplice and some even named another person. Even though Butch never named another person. Butch always said that he acted alone, yet some of this evidence was naming another person. Not being granted enough time to prepare, he had no choice but to continue with the insanity plea. By November 30th, 2000, Butch met with another, with an author, Rick Asuna, and this is where a lot of information comes from. And Butch told him that he did have help killing his family. And so this is really interesting. You know, the Amityville murders, um, the Amityville horror was written long before this. And we'll get into that aspect of it later because that all came from the family that lived in the house after the DeFeos and what they said. And it's interesting that, you know, in his first defense trial, you know, they came up with this um, not guilty by reason of insanity and they went back and forth with all of this, you know, and had they not used that plea, the Amityville horror might never have come about, but they used that plea, which set that up for other things that were said later. But in November 30, on November 30th, 2000, Butch met with this author, Rick Asuna, and told him that he did have help killing his family. And this was something that Asuna shows on his website, amityvillemurders.com. And this was really interesting. This was this website's a really interesting read if you are interested and want to look it up. And that's amityvillemurders.com. The police believed from the beginning that Butch had an accomplice. Butch's attorney fought the court to get evidence admitted that proved Butch did not act alone. Um, and the Butch denied this. In his confession, Butch stated his sister Dawn and two of his friends were involved in the killing. His story was, and this did not come out until 2000. Now remember the murders happened in 1974. So in 2000, <laughs> these, these came out. So his story is that Ronnie DeFeo Sr., the dad, had always been abusive to all of his children. And both parents, Ronnie and Louise, were very controlling of their children. And Louise was very passive when it came to Ronnie's abuse of the children, which I had mentioned all of that before. She just kind of sat back and let it happen. After a particularly bad day, Butch's sister Dawn was really upset because her parents wouldn't let her go to Florida with her boyfriend. She and two of her friends were in the basement getting high that night and Butch was in bed asleep. Someone came into Butch's room and woke him up. This person was standing by his bed holding a shotgun. He stated it looked like his sister. He thought it was his sister Dawn, but he wasn't sure. He followed her to the basement where their two friends were still there. The girl and two friends filled him in on the plan. 
So he's saying the girl, not necessarily his sister. They would kill their parents in their sleep. Um, the younger children would go to their grandparents' home in Brooklyn. And Dawn would go to Florida with her boyfriend. And Butch agreed. So basically, they were just going to kill the parents. And that was it. Just get rid of the parents who were abusive, who were controlling. Get rid of them. Everybody else lives. Everything's good, right? At 3 o'clock on the morning of November 13, 1974, he and Don and one friend went into the parents' room on the second floor while the other friend went down to be a lookout. And both parents were shot in their beds while they slept. Ronnie DeFeo was able to get up and try to fight back, but a second bullet killed him before he could reach them. Louise lay moaning as she bled out, but Butch shot her again and killed her this time. It would be at this point in the story that the two bodies were staged being placed on their stomachs. So this is how the parents were, were killed. Butch states he left his parents' rooms and went downstairs and went outside. He was kind of overcome. One of the friends um, had they had recruited to help had been overcome by the killings and had fled the scene. So at this point, it's just Butch, his sister, and one of the other friends. Butch gave chase to bring the friend back to help clean up. So Butch and this other friend are now gone. They were in this together at this point. They were all together in this and he didn't want anybody to leave until everything was done. While he was out chasing their friend, Dawn has other plans. Dawn, in her alcohol and drug addicted mind, or drug, drug addled mind, I'm sorry, not addicted, addled mind, decided the children are a liability and might have witnessed their crime. So she decides to eliminate them too. So she enters Mark and John's room first. She orders them to lay face down and shoots them on their back. Dawn then goes to Allison's room. Uh, she, the girl raises her head and turns toward Dawn, and the bullet enters her cheek and exits her right ear, killing her instantly. Butch returns to the home and learns Dawn has killed the children. He confronts her on the third floor bedroom where she threw the gun and where he threw her to the bed and shot her in the head. So he kills Dawn. Unburned gunpowder was found on Don's nightgown that collaborates her part in these murders. So that's huge. She had gunpowder, unburned gunpowder, on her nightgown. Asuna attempted to contact the, and interview the friends that were alleged to help, but one was rumored to be in the witness protection program and the other had died. So he couldn't get a hold of them. He couldn't get anything from them. In another confession, very similar to the one Butch made to Asuna, he also states a figure in a dark jacket and gloves gave him a gun. He followed her killing his family to do her bidding. Sometimes when he tells this version, it is his sister Dawn in the jacket and sometimes it's a demon. So, he tells kind of the same story, but it goes from his sister Dawn in a nightgown who was drunk and high and kills his, she kills most of the family and he just helps kill the parents to he kills the family to do the bidding of a woman that might be his sister and might be a demon in a dark jacket. During an interview with Hans Holster, an author who also wrote a book about the murders and the home, Butch stated he had always heard noises and things at night from the time they had moved into the home. You just 
felt someone might be walking around and pipes banging, all these strange noises. In fact, everyone thought someone was there the week we moved, the week after we moved in. They'd been there for 10 years and he didn't make these claims before and these claims didn't come up until this author. They would hear people screaming but couldn't find the source. A painting would move from floor to floor and everyone in the house would deny moving it. His parents thought the devil was in the house and that was another reason for all the religious statues around the house. He had felt very oppressed by the house and ran away several times. He told his father if he didn't let him leave the home, he was afraid he would kill everyone. But the way that they were all afraid of the boy, you would think that they would let him leave the home. And if this was going on in the house and they weren't happy with the house, you'd think they would sell the house and buy another house. It's not like they just didn't have the money. Uh, let's break all this down before we move on to the aftermath and what was really, you know, made this house and the murders famous, which was the Lutz family. First, you have the dad, Ronnie DeFeo, who's under the thumb of the grandfather. He was told he was not good enough to marry the daughter. And although he won that battle, he was reminded that he was indebted to the, the father-in-law for the rest of his life. Because even though he was not good enough to ma marry Louise, and he did, you know, it's kind of like, I won, I, I got this. It was, okay, you got my daughter. You know, she went ahead and did that, even though I didn't want you in the family. But now that you're in the family, you're going to do exactly what I say. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't make me happy, then I'm going to withdraw my money, my support, and you're not going to have that. So, <laughs> he he's kind of indebted to his grandfather. He's kind of, you know, he has to do what his grandfather said, what the father-in-law says. Um, he had a good job but it was directly under his father-in-law. Um, his father-in-law was his boss. He had a nice house, but his father-in-law had bought it. His ch children were spoiled. They were given everything they wanted by their in-laws. Um, he was considered to be abusive, or at least the children said that he was very abusive toward them. But then again, their grandparents gave them everything they wanted, and they were pretty spoiled. Um, he could have anything he wanted as long as his wife was on board with it, as long as his wife approved it, and as long as he kept his wife and his in-laws happy. He was a failure that was kept afloat by his marriage. And that was basically it. He could coast through life as long as he kept everybody else happy. You have Butch, the oldest son, who bore the brunt of Ronnie's anger and frustration over his failure in life. He had been emotionally abused from the time he was a baby he had been physically abused from the time he was a baby. His mother might have stopped it at one time, but she ultimately chose her husband over her son every most of the time, almost every single time. As his siblings were born, some of the abuse trickled down, um, especially um, as he was older and wasn't in the house as much but he was still considered the bad seed. He was the one that was not right in the head. He was the one that was the bad kid. He turned to drugs and alcohol to cope with this. 
He was given a job to occupy his time or possibly to support his wife and child, which he was paid whether or not he was there. Uh, he was coasting through life with no success and nobody expected him to succeed. Everybody expected him to fail, so he was just handed what he needed because he was going to fail, and that was just what was expected. There was a possibility of schizophrenia, bipolar depression. Um, he dissoci seemed to dissociate, and this kind of led him to possibly, this could possibly have been what led him to report seeing a demon or his sister handing him a gun and killing his family, voices telling him to do it. Um, it seems like it could have been, you know, drug-induced. Um, there is such a thing as drug-induced schizophrenia. So there could have been a lot going on there that was causing him to hear voices, to think that there was something going on in the house to have seen things, heard things, you know, or it could have just been, I was angry, I, I wanted out, and the only way out that I could see was to get rid of everybody. Don also seemed to play a big part in these murders, possibly, um, and if they found unburned gunpowder on her nightgown, there's a possibility that she did play a big part or that she fought for the gun. I mean, there's two ways to look at that. Uh, she was the closest in age to Butch. Um, and as siblings, they were close. She also received a lot of abuse from her father. She wanted to move out of the house and go to Florida, um, but was forbidden by their parents, even though she was 18. You know, these two, being 23 and 18, were still being controlled by their family, by their parents. And she was controlled by money, by support. You know, Louisa's parents had pulled support when she married Ronnie. And they held money over the Ronnie and Louise all the time. And so now these parents were doing the same thing. You leave the family, you move out, you do this. I will take your support away. So they felt like they had to do exactly what their family were t was telling them to do. Um, but would she have killed her younger siblings on the chance that one of them saw them kill their parents? Um, was this drug induced? Was it anger, um, jealousy of the younger siblings? Could her brother have killed everybody alone without waking everybody up? There's just so much that we don't know. So now let's look at the spooky aspect of this and where all that came from, um, the movies, all that. So George and Kathy Lutz were looking for a home big enough to comfortably blend their families in the summer of 1975. So a year after these murders. The reported, they reported looking at about 50 homes and loved 112 Ocean Drive, despite its past. They moved in in December 18th, 1975, just over a year after the murders. A friend suggested getting a priest to bless the house due to the murders, uh, and they agreed that this might make everybody feel easier, and they asked a Catholic, Catholic priest to come in and bless the home. You know, just to, just to be safe, just to, you know, help everybody, help the children, everybody feel comfortable. 
And so Father Ray came to the house. As the priest left, he told them he felt something strange upstairs in the bedroom. Um, the one with the half windows, the one that the windows that look like eyes. Uh, this had been Butch's bedroom. He said they would be fine as long as no one slept in that bedroom. The family had intended to turn the upstairs room into a sew sewing room, so they felt that everybody would be fine, that there was not gonna be any problems. The priest left and later reported hearing a voice telling him to get out uh, when he was in the upstairs room and seeking, and he said that he sought medical attention for blisters on his hands that he received during the day of that blessing but he didn't tell the Lutz family any of this, he says. The Lutz family reported experiences that started immediately after moving into the house. They said they had cold spots throughout the house, they felt strange vibes, and they heard sounds. Um, the family started to immediately have personality changes, especially George. Um, the dad, he started to obsess over a fireplace that didn't get hot enough. He secluded himself from the family. He heard what sounded like a marching band, but no one else could hear it. He never wanted to leave the house. He was just obsessed with this house. Kathy Lutz also had dramatic events occurring almost immediately. She claimed to be touched by somebody that wasn't there. Uh, she also claimed to wake up with the face of an old hag that would take hours to go away. Uh, the youngest daughter, Missy, started to see an angel that showed itself in the form of a pig with red eyes. And the pig's name was Jody. Now, I'm sorry, I have a baby piglet and she is so cute and I hate the fact that pigs are, that pigs are associated with evil, even though they sound like demons when they scream. It just, it breaks my heart because they're not evil. George and Kathy, the parents claim to have seen two red eyes staring at them from outside and Missy said, she thought that Jody was wanting inside the house. George and Kathy started inviting people over just to see if others heard noises that they were hearing. They would put the children to bed and sit downstairs with their friends and hear people walking around upstairs. The parents and the friends would rush up the stairs to find the children sound asleep. In one interview, George said, there is such an emotional moment when someone else confirms to you that what you're hearing is also being heard by somebody else. It's not just you hearing it. It's not just your imagination. And I can understand that. That would be pretty emotional for me too, if I were hearing things. So the last night the Lutzes were in the home was the worst activity. George and Kathy, George says that he watched Kathy levitate off the bed and start sliding away from the bed. He felt paralyzed while watching her being dragged away and someone else get in bed with him. He heard the children's bed slamming up and down in their rooms and being dragged across the floor. They all heard pigeons fluttering around upstairs in the upstairs bedroom and in the air conditioner vents but when they checked the next morning, there was no pigeons or any evidence of pigeons. Uh, they had brought the dog in and tied him to the doorknob and he spent the night walking in circles and vomiting. Lights flickered on and off. And I do want to point out that they said they brought the dog in and tied him to the doorknob and the DeFeo family had a dog that they also tied up in the home. 
So lights flickered on and off and the kids said they could not get downstairs to their parents and they were scared while George and Kathy were unable to get upstairs to the children. The next morning, George and Kathy tried to reach Father Ray, but he couldn't come and help him them or didn't come and help them. So they left the house on January 14, 1976. So they moved in in December 1975 and left in January 1976. So they were only there a few weeks. The, a news reporter helped the Lutz family contact Ed and Lorraine Warren and asked them to investigate the house. So this is where the Warrens come in and this is the case that made them famous because it really brought them into the spotlight. They believed it was not an ordinary haunting and there were no ghosts in the house. They assembled a group of mediums to help with their investigation. Mary Pescarella was one of these mediums and she says that she could see past events. She felt cold spots and became ill, had heart palpitations, a shortness in breath when climbing the stairs, she said that she saw a black mass that formed a head and moved, and she stated when it moved, she felt threatened. At one point, um, Albert Riley, another psychic, said he felt similar to Mary when he was in the stairs, um, when he was in the upstairs bedroom. So both of them felt very ill in the house. Um, the Warrens reported the land had been owned by a man who practiced dark magic and had been buried on the property. The Lutzes said it was too risky for them to move back into the home and refused to have an exorcism. They gave the house back to the bank on January 30th, 1976, one month after purchasing the property. At one point, the Warrens reported, um, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why that's in my notes twice. I guess that was very important that at one point, a man practiced dark magic on the land and was buried there. I would think that um, a man being buried on the property, I guess it depends on when the man was buried on the property, but you think that it would be marked unless it was a long, long time ago. Um, and dark magic, I, I don't, I don't know. And um, there were reports of green goo coming out of the walls, furniture levitating, and voices being heard by the Lutz. The Lutz family moved on and reported no further activity within their new home. Another family purchased the house in Amityville and claims that there's no activity in the home. And I want to point out that the DeFeo family lived in the house for 10 years before the murders. And outside of Butch's claims after the murders and years after the murders, I should say, um, there there weren't reports of anything going on in the home outside of him saying all these years later that, oh, yeah, there were things that were going on in the home. And this was being told to a reporter who was writing a book about the home. And this was after books and movies came out about the home being haunted. So, I don't know. And now these people are living in the house and saying there's nothing going on. There are many people who believe that the Lutz family, George and Kathy, made up their story in an attempt to gain money. And there are some things that support this claim. Uh, first, they knew that the home had recent murders. In fact, it had been just over a year since these brutal, gruesome murders had occurred. And at this point, Butch hadn't said anything about anything supernatural occurring in the home, but he had been found guilty by reason of insanity. They knowingly purchased the home 
with all the furnishings inside, they chose to keep everything that was left in the home. They were struggling financially and they knew they could sell their story for books or possibly a movie if they made it sound good enough. However, they got a great deal on a very, very nice home. I mean, remember marble floors, crystal chandeliers, uh, a house that the DeFeos couldn't afford, but that the Louisa's parents bought for them. And now after this, obviously the house wasn't going to sell. So the Lutzes bought it and they, they got a pretty good deal on this murder house. And they were able to get quite a bit of money for all their rights, their story rights. Uh, they claim to have been skeptical and to not believe in ghosts going into their the home. Their story was very sensational. I mean, it was over the top when you really look at, I mean, green goo coming out of the walls, levitation, beds going up and down, moving around, not being able to get upstairs, the kids not being able to get downstairs, um, an angel pig. It, it was very over the top, very sensational. And it seems that most of what happened happened all in one night. Like they were there for only a few weeks Things happened, but then all of a sudden in one night, all the stuff happened and they ran out. Um, it was scary, uh, but Butch walking through the home with a shotgun shooting everybody in the family seems even scarier. It, it seems like, you know, you have this family that just comes up with this wild, crazy, paranormal stuff that was just really over the top that didn't go along with anything with the history of this house. Nothing to do with this, with anything that had happened in this house. You know, when you have this house, that not only, that just over a year ago, a 23 year old man walked through the house with a shotgun and killed every single person in his family. I would think that would be pretty scary. I think if I were going to move into a murder house, I would be using that as my, oh my gosh, this is happening and this place is haunted. This place is creepy, scary, crazy rather than all all the crazy stuff that they came up with. Anyway, I I really think that the the true crime what real, what happened that night, even if we don't know the full story of what happened that night, was so much scarier than anything that the Lutz family came up with. Regardless, you can get lost in the plethora of Amityville movies that have been made. Um, unlike the Conjuring world um, that Annabelle belongs in, uh, these movies have been lost in sequels that are kind of standalone. It's crazy. I've seen several Amityville movies that I don't know, they really didn't make a whole lot of sense. I've, I saw the original and I saw the remake that, stand, that stands pretty true to the original. And I have to say, I love the movies. I'm not gonna say, I, I love the movies. I love the story. Um, I've read the case by the Warrens. I love the Warrens. I'm not gonna, I, I really, you know, I love true crime, but I also love the paranormal. And if you listen to my podcast, you you know that and stuff. But 
I also watched, I don't know if it was a second Amityville. I watched it when I was a kid and the one thing that I remember is a man working on a garbage disposal and he puts his hand down in it and the house flicks the disposal on and it like chews his hand up and I have the hardest time with garbage disposals now and putting my hand down in the garbage disposal to get stuff out. It scares me to death, even though my house is not haunted. Um, <laughs> so it, that and there was a lamp and that's all I remember of that one. There was a crazy lamp, but those didn't really go along with the actual story. It was just, I guess, money makers, um, really bad B horror movies, which, um, are my guilty pleasure. Really bad horror movies and sci-fi movies, I have to admit I love. Um, anyway, uh, back to our story. Um, they, these movies have taken a lot of liberties. They've stretched the truth because they're movies and they have to make good movies, you know. Um, the sequels that were made in the 80s made good ghost stories. And I think that's really all that they were looking for was good ghost stories because obviously there weren't multiple people that moved into this home and it continued to be haunted. The third family that moved into this home didn't have any problems with it. Um, at this point, they have changed the address. So the address is no longer 112 Ocean Avenue um, because that address has become synonymous with the movie and has really been this murder, demon, ghost house. But the house is still there. The house is still owned by people. So don't go to the house and try to see the house. Um, it is owned by people and nothing happens there. It's not said to be haunted or anything, um, but it was the site of a very, very gruesome and brutal murder, um, multiple murder of this family by um, Ronald DeFeo Jr. and possibly his sister Dawn and possibly others. Um, and that's our first episode of Murder Maps, 112 Ocean Avenue, Amityville, Long Island. I hope to see you on episode two. Bye.